Tonight, we are honored to host Dr. Jose Fernandez. He has uh, an engineering degree in aeronautical engineering, and his uh, PhD is in computer science. Uh, both of these, I believe, from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. Uh, he has over 30 years' experience in industry, uh, involved with projects dealing in software development and maintenance of large systems, uh, in particular relating to real-time systems for air traffic control, uh, power plants, avionics, and also cellular phone applications. Uh, up until 2018, he held associate's professorship at Polytechnic University of Madrid. Um, and with that, I'd like to s now turn the podium, virtual podium over to Dr. Fernandez. The presentation is, uh, is large, uh, but I think it's interesting to, to, to deal some, some time with the overview of this methodology, so you can compare it with other methodologies. But the main topic of the presentation is the domain modeling. The domain modeling or domain-driven modeling or domain-driven design, that is the, the, the approach I recommend here to bridge between the system and the software architecture. So the main topic of the of the presentation is seven, but I will devote some time to the introduction to the methodology. As you know, and there is a technical report by Jeff Stefan, published by Incosi, that an MBC methodology is a process or logical sequence of steps, what to be done a method of technique, how to be done, that are methods are best practices that we use in this methodological process, and a tool. The, this methodology I will explain today that is called IEC and PPOA, Integrated Systems Engineering and Profits Pipelines in Object-Oriented Architectures, is a tool agnostic methodology. We are using diverse tools, Currently, we are using a very well-known commercial tool, but it's tool agnostic. Uh, whatever tool uh, supporting CCML is okay for using this method. It's important to understand this slide. This methodology uses some distance engineering principles that are typical of traditional systems engineering. These principles drive the use of some best practices. And these best practices are included in the methodology process. The methodology process is a, a it consists of steps. It produces some deliverables, models, or views of the model, and it has some participants, systems engineers, requirements engineers, uh, domain people, whatever. This process uses a framework. What we mean by a framework? We mean by a framework, an ontology, so the description of the concepts used in the methodology, and the views. The views that are CML diagrams, we use the n square chart, and I will explain later the reason. We think it's the best mm, view to represent functional interfaces. And we use textual description of functions and system parts as well. So we have a process, a methodological process, and we have a methodology framework. The framework is composed of the ontology and the views. The views are CISML diagrams, the n square chart, and textual descriptions. This, is, this slide is explaining the, the same, so I will skip it. The principles, the definition of systems engineering principle, a principle is a guide to the definition and application of systems engineering processes. And a principle transcends a particular life cycle model or phase. Here, 
we are using the following principles. The first principle we are using is breast-first development. So, we recommend a breast-first approach in which scope is covered comprehensively before fidelity. So, we prefer cover all the subsistence before the fidelity, after I will explain this with mo in more detail. Another principle is form follow function. So, in this methodology, the functional architecture is the core, is the core of the views, because the physical architecture is based on the functional architecture. This is not the case in all, all the model-based systems engineering methods, and I, I recommend you to compare. Another principle is modularity or modular design. When we build the logical architecture, the first version of the physical architecture, this first version is based in modularity. So each module or logical block in, the, in this physical architecture has functional cohesion and minimum coupling with other models. There is a good definition of a scope and fidelity by Topper and Horner that are, uh, in this time they were working in uh, the Applied Physics Lab in John Hopkins University. And they define a scope as the area within the boundaries of the problem space. And fidelity is defined as the level of detail. So what we are defending here is don't sacrifice a scope and you can sacrifice fidelity depending of the money and the budget you have for to build the model or the time you have to build the model. But it's important, don't sacrifice the scope. Why, uh, what is the scope in this methodology? The scope in this methodology is all system inputs and outputs should be represented and we use this ML context diagram. All use case and, or interaction between the system and external entities are represented using this ML use case diagram. All functionality is represented using functional hierarchy block definition diagrams, this ML, functional interfaces using not SysML support and square chart, but we implemented it in the in the tool. All and all functional flows, all not the main functional flows, representing the response of our system to some event, events. We use activity diagrams for that purpose. It's important to represent also all quality attributes that are important for us. So we represent what we call the quality model. The quality model is represented with a block definition diagram. And in the quality model, we represent the quality attributes that are interested for, are for interest for us. For example, safety, reliability, usability, resilience, whatever. It's important to represent also systems and their interfaces, matter, energy, or data. We use SysML internal block diagram, and we also represent system requirements, functional and non-functional. Requirements diagrams in SysML or requirements tables. Normally, the tools support both. To understand this methodology, it's important, as I mentioned before, to understand the framework, and the framework is the ontology and the view supported by the methodology. I will explain briefly the ontology. The ontology are the main concepts supported in this methodology. So we have a system, a system of interest. The system of interest is composed of parts. Parts can be simple or composite. Well, the system interacts with an environment. This interaction is represented by operational context. The operational context is represented 
by a group of scenarios of use cases. From these scenarios, we obtain operational needs. This, from these operational needs that are, that are raw requirements specified from the point of view of the actors of the scenarios, from these needs, we infer the system capabilities. Capabilities are in the term, the term capabilities, the ability to perform something. The capabilities are aggregation of system properties. These properties may be quality attributes, states of the system, physical properties, max, color, length, etc., or functional properties, functionalities. These properties are specified by requirements. An important issue that is different from other methodologies. Requirements typically are allocated to system parts, but non-functional requirements are not allocated, are implemented, because non-functional requirements, in some cases, you need to use architectural patterns to implement them. So you use heuristics and architectural patterns to implement non-functional requirements in the architecture. In the book, in chapter six, there is a collection of six heuristics I collected during the last 20 years. Currently, Incosi is working also in heuristics group, and they have more heuristics, but the heuristics are more general. Here are heuristics related with design. And are heuristics that I collected from different sources. In chapter six of the book, you have the heuristics and the sources where I collect the heuristics. To represent the views, we use what we call dimensions. The methodology has three dimensions. One dimension is related with the mission. In the mission dimension, the system is a black box that interacts with the environment. This dimension is represented by use cases or scenarios, operational of user needs and capabilities. Another dimension is the system as a white box. In this dimension, we represent system requirements using CSML, functional architecture representing functional hierarchies and functional behavior represented by activity diagrams, and physical architecture represented by block definition diagrams to represent physical hierarchies, and internal block diagrams to represent uh, parts, ports, and connectors. And we have another dimension for software intensive subsystems. We use what we call the domain model to bridge the system dimension and the software dimension is the topic of the today presentation, the use of the domain model. We represent a structural view of the software architecture using UML class diagrams. And we represent a behavioral view of the software architecture using activity diagrams, UML activity diagrams. This is what we call PPOA. PPOA is here. PPOA is a framework and as a methodology to represent software architecture in for real-time systems. If you are you, um, developing another kind of software system, you can use another framework different, another software framework different from PPOA. It's possible, yes. In this methodology, it's very important the use of hierarchies. We have functional hierarchies, the most difficult to, for people, for my students, and also for the engineers I train. The most difficult hierarchy is to build a good functional hierarchy because for engineers and also for students, it's very difficult to identify children functions of, of one function. In the training, uh, that is, um, the training of these methodologies uh, around from 25 hours to 30 hours of training. We teach some guides 
to identify children functions. The physical hierarchy is very common and the engineers understand it well. And it's not problematic. So you, we represent subsystems and we decompose each subsystem in parts. And also we have the quality trees. Quality trees when we represent quality attributes and the non-functional requirements that rep, um, are uh, specify each quality attribute. The, the non-functional requirements are based on the quality attributes and the part of the or the complete system. What that some people um, call this the topic. So the non-functional requirements have two parts: the quality attribute and the topic where the non-functional requirement applies. We represent the main views are the functional hierarchy, the n square chart, when we represent in the diagonal functionalities and in the, in the cells the interfaces, what they interchange, mass, energy, or signals, or data, we represent as activity diagrams the functional flows, and we represent in tabular format a description of each function. As I mentioned before, the most difficult is to build hierarchies. We represent as well the physical architecture of the system, where we represent subsystems, subsystems with, with their parts. We represent internal block diagrams where we represent each instance and the connectors between these instances. We represent a, a functional flow with allocation by usage. So we have the function F2 is allocated by usage to part D here. In CSML, as you know, we have allocation by usage and allocation by definition. We are using both. And also, we represent textually the description of each part. So, to build this functional architecture and physical architecture, we use a methodological process. This methodological process is based in what we call an out-in approach. So we see the system from the outside to the inside. So the first step is how the system as a black box operates in a context. Second step is identify and specify, specify the operational needs. So raw requirements from the point of view of the actors, not from the point of view of the system. So the operational need, the subject of the operational need is the actor. Identify a model the system external interfaces. Identify a model the system functions. Specify system requirements. Identify a model subsystems and their interfaces. So the approach is from outside in south. This approach works very well and works very well with the tools we are using, with the commercial tools we are using for model-based systems engineering. Here is the same approach uh, represented by steps. First, we identify operational scenarios. Second, we specify capabilities and high-level functional requirements. We specify the quality attributes and system non-functional requirements. And after, we uh, begin uh, constructing the functional architecture. So we identify high-level functions, decompose these functions into child functions. This is the more complex uh, part, perhaps, and represent the functional architecture using n square charts and functional flow. When this functionality, functional architecture is complete, that is, we have low level children functions that can be allocated independently, we can allocate these functions to models. 
and we represent what we call the modular architecture. When the fun all the functionality is allocated, we finish with the modular architecture, and we refine the modular architecture because we need to implement non-functional requirements using heuristics. So we refine the, mo the modular architecture using heuristics to implement non-functional requirements. We use as well trade off analysis, for example, to evaluate different technical alternatives to the refined architecture. So we use two, two, techni two techniques, heuristics and trade off analysis. There are some examples in, in the web page of the, of the methodology in the OM, OMG wiki space, uh, model-based systems engineering methodologies. There is an example of a medical device where we uh, use refinement to implement some safety requirements and safety heuristics. Here I explain these steps with more detail. So in the first step is identify use cases and scenarios. In the second step, the important thing is represent capabilities with a hierarchical decomposition. Capabilities is not always used in the methodology because capabilities is best understood by people in the aerospace sector and in other sectors. But in other sectors, it's more difficult to explain the, than the concept of capability. In these cases, we use top-level, uh, high-level functions and the quality model. We, the, it's very important to have a good quality model when we identify the quality attributes that are important for us, for example, security, reliability, resilience, whatever. This quality model is represented as a CSML block definition diagram. It's very important to identify the high level functionality. We can use two approaches. In one approach, we identify high level functions using literature. For example, in the case of a commercial aircraft, INCOSI has a very good definition of the functionality of a commercial aircraft. So don't reinvent the wheel. Use this functionality and adapt it to your project. We adapt it, for example, for an unmanned area vehicle. In other cases, we use the out-in approach. So we have the inputs and outputs from the outside to our system. So we identify the functions that have to process these inputs and outputs. Because in this methodology, the concept of function, function is a transformation, a transformation from inputs to outputs. So we have two approaches. One, identify high-level functions or identify inputs and outputs from the outside and the functionality needed to transform these inputs. The most difficult, uh, one of the most difficult steps is to compose function into child functions. We decompose a function if it has several inputs and outputs. Um, so a child function is the function that processes or transforms one of these inputs or one of these outputs. So the consistency between parent function and children function is that the children processes or transform some of the inputs of the parent function. This is a, a topic not very well treated in CSML because when they represent functional behavior, they don't represent exactly more or less exactly the same children function that a function that is called by other functions, and it's not the same. It's not the same to be a children that to be called by our other function. This is a very important topic that in the training I, I emphasize and in, uh, several times to the people to understand the difference between to be called and to be, child, to be child of a parent function. So when we have all this uh, functionality, we represent the functionality with 
block definition diagrams for hierarchical, the hierarchical functionality, n square chart, several n square charts for functional interfaces, and activity diagrams for functional flows. The important topic um, issue is that from the n square chart and the functional hierarchy, in, we implemented in a tool, semi-automatically identify the functional flows. So you, um, from the n square chart and the out in relations in the n square chart, you can semi-automatically in the tool obtain some functional flows. We um, have some examples in uh, electric parking brake of a car, and you can uh, we present these examples in webinars to the in COSI Germany and in COSI UK. So you can in these webinars are recorded, and so you can uh, uh, see them. <coughs> you can watch the recording in in the web pages of German in COSI Germany and in COSI UK. Very important issues allocate functions. We allocate functions first using the heuristics of modularity that are descript, described in chapter six. And we represent the modular architecture. And after we implement non-functional requirements using heuristics, and we use straight studies to select mm, preferred physical architectures that optimize measure of effectiveness. So we have the modular architecture and we refine it using heuristics and trade studies. This process is performed iteratively because we select some, in some cases, non-functional requirements have conflicts between them. For example, security might have conflicts with performance. Um, some non-functional requirements will, uh, may have some conflict with usability, for example. Well, in this point, I will uh, talk uh, a little about the framework, the software framework we are using that is called PPOA. This is a software architecting framework for real-time systems, real-time reactive systems. So we, in this framework, uh, propose some building blocks that are components and coordination mechanisms, and we propose some views. This is the reason it's called an architectural framework. When we talk about a software architectural framework, is building blocks and the views. Since we are talking about real-time systems, the component here is implemented using other tags, Java thread or light processes supported by real-time operating systems. So we have components that are called controller is asynchronous event handler. Domain component, typically the main component is a passive component that implements some domain class. A structure, typically a list, typically uh, other type of component, components that maintain relation between objects. And we have process components to implement the independent threads of execution okay, that are implemented uh, in, as an add attacks or a, a Java three thread. To coordinate these threads, we need coordination mechanisms that are typically provided by real-time operating systems. For example, band buffers, semaphores, uh, mailboxes, etc. Typically, these coordination mechanisms are used in monoprocessor systems. In multi-core systems, you have another coordination me mechanism, for example, spin lock, etc. So this method is more, this framework, PPOA, is more useful for one core uh, or monoprocessor system or in, if you are using partitions and a hypervisor for inside a partition. If you need other coordination mechanisms to use between partitions. This is a complex issue in real-time systems. I don't know if you know, but it's interesting to mention that. <clears throat> the architecture process here 
The first step is the topic of this uh, presentation is create a domain model. So we create from the functional architecture, we identify the functionality that should be implemented as software. From the description of this functionality, we create a domain model. This is not the approach typical in other uh, methodologies because they wait for the physical architecture to identify blocks that are implemented as software. Here, no. We implement, uh, identify functions to be implemented by software. From this domain model, we um, identify software components, model the main thread, identify the coordination mechanisms, and represent the software architecture. This is an important topic in this. What is a domain model? A domain model is a class diagram representing concepts that should be implemented by the software. These concepts are not only physical things. These concepts typically are events, physical things, roles, and description. For example, if you are implementing a, a sensor, you have a thing that you represent in the domain model is the sensor. But you have to represent as well, in another class, the event. The event is measurement. The measurement is an event. And also, uh, you have another domain class that is the sensor de description, the description by the manufacturer. This is, so, instead of one class sensor, you have the class sensor, that is the physical abstraction of the sensor, the class measurement, that is an event, and the class sensor description, that is the specification of the sensor by the manufacturer. This is a very mm, difficult thing for engineers to uh, abstract in this way, but it's important, very, very important. From the domain model, using approaches of component-based development, we identify, identify software components. Today, I will not talk about that. And also, we identify, as we are in a real-time system, the main threats of execution. And we identify the coordination mechanisms between these threats. And we represent the architecture. In here, we use a class that extended class diagram to represent the static view of the architecture. And we use activity diagrams to represent the behavior. So we use activity diagrams at the system level, and we use activity diagrams at the software level to represent behavior in both cases. Domain model, very important thing. The domain model is the bridge between the system and the software architectures. Very important. It's important to understand that software does not meet the physical law, laws of mass, energy, and momentum. And software can be, components can be created and destroyed. Software components are not only abstractions of physical things, are abstractions of non-physical entities. For example, events, roles, descriptions, etc. So we are using here to bridge from the system, integrated system engineering, and the software part, we use what is called domain driven modeling or domain driven design. In the reference, you have one, two books, very interesting, very useful, uh, using domain driven design. In domain driven design, the books, uh, um, one of the books is Evans, you have the concept of, you have classes. You represent in the main model these classes that represent things, events, roles, descriptions. And you represent the relation between classes, so mainly generalization or inheritance, specialization is the same, is part of, of aggregation, is member of, and associations. A domain model is an essential input when the system is shaped in software architecture. The scene and implementation. How we work? 
In the domain model, we talk about three important topics. We mean by an entity, a class of in, in the domain model, defined primarily by its identity. So a class that has identity is an entity. For example, the class person has an identity. Which is the identity of the class person? In the US, for example, it's the security, social security number. Here in Spain, it's the, the DNI. Okay? It's a number that identifies you. A value object is a domain object without identity that describes things. For example, your name is a value object because your name might be shared by different entities, by different persons. Different persons might have a name, Jose. So, myself, as an entity, I have an identity, my DNA. Okay? But my name is a valuable object that other entities also might share. An aggregate is a cluster of associated objects treated as a unit when a data changes. The root class of each aggregate owns all other classes clustered inside it. Very important and very inter difficult in some cases. Each aggregate is designed to be change, changed consistently. So protect business invariants inside aggregate. Aggregates should be as small as possible. Each class in the domain is represent is described what we call a class responsibility collaboration card. In this um, description, we use the class name and the class responsibilities that are not the class methods. Is what the class knows, its attributes, its attributes, and what the class does. Typically, operations, but not methods. Methods is implementation here, which are not at the implementation level. Collaboration is other classes that this class collaborate to obtain something or to do something. For example, this is a robot developed by the author of the book, Carlos, and his team at the University of Delft in Holland. Carlos is an expert in robotics. Here is the robot. It's a collaborative robot with a robotic arm with sensors in the skin, in the skin of the arm. The sensors avoid collision with other with people or other things. The arm picks and plays things, picks from one box and plays in another box. We represent the context diagram. We represent the scenarios, the scenarios at deployment, and the scenarios at operation. For example, system start, manage order, pick product, deliver product, etc. We can represent these scenarios as use cases and use a use case diagram. The functional architecture, here we have the functional tree, the main functional tree, so we have here the top level functions and children functions for F5 and F6. These are the children function of X5, F6, uh, F5 and F6. Very important. We need to represent some functions. We use several N square charts and we represent in the diagonal functions, a group of functions, and in the cells. For example, functional F4 sends product index to functional F61. This uh, n square chart, the convention in inputs in columns. Here, this um, in, in this uh, this row is inputs that come from outside the group, and this column is outputs from out to outside the group. But if you have here in this cell is F5 sends this gripper over product stack to 
this functionality. This a schematic view of the functional interfaces is very helpful because you have here what we call out-in relations. This is the output of this function is an input to this function. So this function depends on this function. When you build the functional flow, this function is after this function. This is very interesting and very helpful. So we build these functional flows based in the hierarchies and in the n square charts. In some cases, we use uh, we implement this semi-automatically. Here, this is not functional flow, it's function control flow. This function is before this function. This is control flow. Okay. Here are sequential functions. Here is the control flow between some sequential functions. And after we build the physical architecture where we have the hierarchical, physical hierarchical, and internal block diagrams to represent parts and the connectors between parts. Here. So what in answer? The first thing is identify functions. We have the list of functions. We identify the functions that will be implemented as software. All the functions to be implemented by the control block are implement control block is software. So all these functionalities are implemented by software. We, we need to have the description of these functions, the textual description. In this textual description, we identify nouns that are candidates to be domain model classes and verbs that are candidates to be associations. So we build the domain model. Here in the domain model, we have the main nouns as classes. We have, for example, we have an aggregation that is important here. Order and product is an aggregation. We have a trajectory repository because it's another aggregation that is needed because we have identified some mm, trajectories we, uh, for avoid undeterminate, uh, not deterministic. We use some specified trajectory. So we have a trajectory repository. Each class is represented, is described by a CRC card, class responsibility collaboration card. The name of the class, the functions and attributes it has or implements, and other classes it collaborates. Very important. Is it easy to build a good domain model? No. I remember some years ago, I worked for a very large aerospace company, American, uh, developing a domain model of aircraft trajectories for a, a tool for performance of aircraft trajectories, performance evaluation. And it takes to me uh, months to develop the domain model. I am an aeronautical engineer, but I need to read about the attributes of trajectories, the types of trajectories, whatever. So, as I mentioned, we have the domain model is the bridge between the system functionality that is implemented and by software and the software architecture. Domain model is the bridge. So we bridge the software from the functional architecture, not from the physical architecture, not from the system physical architecture. Other methodologies identify first blocks, physical blocks, and after they transform these physical blocks in software components. But they don't give some they don't give guidelines to this transformation. Here the guide the guidelines are the guidelines of the mind modeling. After you have the domain model, you implement the domain model as software components using 
the building blocks of the framework of the software framework here PPOA. We are using we are using the building blocks, process, domain component, semaphores, um, buffers. These are the building blocks of the framework. With these building blocks, we build the software architecture, the static view. The dynamic view is using uh, activity diagrams. In these activity diagrams, we, we have an interruptible region to avoid undeterministic behavior. The only place in all this activity flow where you have undeterministic behavior is inside this uninterruptible region that is when the uh, sensors in the arm detect some obstacle. To conclude, so we provide a methodology to formalize the use of functionality to obtain the system and software physical architectures. So the core of this methodology is the functional architect, architecture, that is the input to build the physical architecture and to build the software architecture. The domain model is the bridge between the system and the software architecture. And domain modeling is performed based, as I mentioned before, on the functional architecture, not on the physical architecture. To know more, I recommend the book and the wiki. This wiki is in the OMG. I am the editor of the part of the wiki, of this part of the wiki. So I uh, update it with um, new art papers we publish, with new webinars, whatever. Uh, also, I recommend you other references that are very interesting to complement. For example, for component-based development, software components-based development, this book is very good. Desmond de Sousa has a methodology called Catalysis, that is a very good methodology to develop software components. So I, thank you very much, and I fin I, I'm open to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Um, in the audience, if you've got questions, feel free to um, unmute yourself and, and ask, or you can type them in the chat. Uh, Dr. Fernandez, oh. Jeff Burlett here. I enjoyed Hello. your talk, and I have a question for you. My mm -hmm. question is, what are the challenges with modeling systems when systems are uh, non-deterministic due to AI and, and other automated automation uh, techniques that are changing systems uh, for performance reasons or for cyber defense reasons and uh, the models are no longer static and well understood by humans. It's a difficult topic. I am not expert in this topic. Carlos is more expert than myself. And Carlos is working in what they call metamodels. So they metamodel the functionality, so they have hierarchies, and the functionality is not always the same. So in the case of this robotic, the, the robotic has some awareness of the situation, and based on the metamodel, it changes the functionality if there is some change. And this change of the functionality is built uh, also as hierarchies, but dynamic hierarchies, dynamic hierarchies. And I, I can recommend you some bibliography. Please send to me an email, and I or, or I send to you the contact to Carlos. Okay, the, the okay. call for that is an expert in this area. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, I was just curious to like. Um, the accept the acceptances for for using the pipeline of processing method in building software systems compared to the uh, traditional more traditional uh, methodologies is is oh yeah I developed a um, TPOA um, earlier than 
systems, the model-based systems engineering approach. Um, we build a, a, also a, a tool, uh, um, some companies uh, request. Um, companies, for example, um, in the automotive uh, um, sector and also in other uh, sectors. People working in real-time systems. Um, um, systems where you have, you react some, to some external events or time events. If you need to react to time events or external events, and it's important to meet some deadlines, PPOA is, is good. Also, PPOA can be um, simulated with a tool that is called CHEDAR, that is developed by the University of Brest in France. So the model, the architectural models are simulated by Chadar. So we build a XML bridge to implement in Chadar the model um, um, developed with a PPOA framework. And the problem with um, our tool is not a, was not a commercial tool. So some companies, and, some automatic companies in Germany uh, told me that they prefer they prefer commercial tools because in, in, in PPOA was developed by, by my group in the university was a university tool not a commercial tool so companies are not uh, they prefer commercial tools for reasons of trust I think they trust more in commercial tools that in tools developed by universities or research groups. Okay, thank you. Um, let me share my screen here a second. Uh, can I share my screen? Share. So first I wanna, I wanna give you this sort of formal thanks. I know it's very early in the morning there for you, so we appreciate you showing up tonight. Okay. Um, Good, thank you. Yeah, I'll send you, a, I'll send you a, uh, a, a copy of this. Normally, we'll, you know, when you're in person, I'll hand you a framed version of it, but... Um, send to me a copy, but, but I like. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so now um, let, me, uh, let me raffle off your book here to some lucky uh, attendee. So I got all the attendees' names in this... Um, Wheel of uh, Fortune and Cozy Wheel of Fortune, and the winner is Lawrence Walker. Congratulations, Lawrence. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, one thing, too, I wanted to mention if there's any, is there any other further questions for Dr. Fernandez? Again, we appreciate you being here tonight. If somebody has any questions, you can email me, you have my email in COSI email, and I will answer you. Uh, I recommend also to, to watch the OMG wiki space, and we are publishing papers and other uh, research we are doing these days, okay. Uh, yeah, and the slides for this, uh, we'll do an after action report on the NCOSI uh, Chesapeake chapter website, and the video and the slides will be made available for folks to review. Um, so with that, oh, I did want to do one more plug for an upcoming event that I forgot to mention earlier. November, we, didn't, we just recently scheduled our November event, and that speaker is going to talk on um, cloud native security and policy, a primer. Um, so uh, his name is um, Evan Kwasinski. And uh, he's a cloud architect. So uh, for those of you who are interested in cloud security, uh, tune in to November's talk. Otherwise, I wish you all a good night. And we'll see you at the next one.